On this certain day in November. Woo! Woo 24th. 24th day of November, Thanksgiving week at UCLA, where it's a beautiful day. We're thankful. We're thankful. The sunshine is shining. What else would it do? <laughs> and we're about to hear an extemporaneous speech from Nick, who's going to address the question, why is China building new islands in the South China Sea? Why is China building new islands in the South China Sea? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Nick. Hi, Nick. Hi, Nick. Hi, Nick. How many of you guys had, like growing up, had a bully? Someone who kind of pushed you around, teased you? I know I did. I had several. Um, excellent. And that's kind of like what China is doing right now. It's one of my major points in the argument I'm going to be making, um, so I'll get back to that later on. China is building new islands in the South China Sea for three main reasons. These three main reasons are for the natural resources available, to gain control of very important sea territories and to push other nations and see how far they will bend. This is important to us, even though it doesn't seem like it, it's kind of far away, right? It's not territory that we're come, like, actively trying to gain, so why does it matter to us? It matters because, imagine if that bully who had teased you, picked on you, Imagine if every time they teased you and picked on you, they got a little bit bigger, they got a little bit stronger, they got a little bit more confident, got a little bit more cocky. It would eventually lead to bad news for you, right? They would eventually get too confident and they would act on something that they had been threatening you with. That is what China is doing right now. That is the danger that we face and that is why this matters to everyone. My first point is that China is building new islands in the South China Sea for the resources available. These natural resources are bountiful, and they include fish, gas, and oil. There's rampant overfishing in this area because of many different nations who are all trying to gain these resources. Um, and yet, for some reason, it doesn't seem to be killing off the fish population. John McManus of who's a professor at, Miami, at University of Miami, believes that this is because of what he's calling pulses. These pulses are fish larvae that are spreading through the environment. They're being flooded in every couple of years, keeping that uh, population extremely high and making it so that they can continue to fish these areas and supply their populations. <clears throat> Another very important point is that oil and gas reserves are believed to be very potent in this area. They're underneath the seabed, there's many of them, and that's according to Robin McDowell of the Associated Press in 2011. My second point for why China is building new islands in the South China Sea is because of the important sea territories that are available here. Um, this is a very high, hotly contested area. It's being fought over by Malaysia, Taiwan, Vietnam, China, and um, one more, I can't remember. It. Taiwan. Taiwan. These five nations are fighting over this very hotly contested territory, and it's hotly contested because of the borders it creates. The borders of these islands encapsulate a very important sea route. This trade route, it does over $5 trillion in trading every year. $1.2 trillion of this is entirely for the U.S. It's U.S. involved, it's U.S. related. It's a very extreme area, and it, controlling that could be vital in any kind of a situation for China. They're also doing this to extend the borders in this area. Extending these borders allows them to gain more land in an area that's very highly populated, and they need this land to house their people. My final point is that China is building new islands in the South China Sea 
so that they can push other nations, including the United States, the neighboring nations, and the UN. This is the most important point of the speech, and it is the most important because it, it's the bully analogy, right? Um, China here, there's a great conflict here because of this important trade route. Basically, this important trade route, uh, the U.S. doesn't want them to control it. So, the U.S. is quoting the U.N. Convention of the Law of Sea, and basically it says that any, any island that's man-made and used to be submerged does not have the traditional 12 nautical mile border that can be claimed around it. These islands used to be submerged, it shouldn't be in contention, and yet China is fighting this with every, everything they have. Uh, the U.S. sent a destroyer in to this area, and China responded by saying, by threatening the vessel and saying, it would be a pity for us to realize that we have to strengthen and speed up relevant construction activities. This was said by Liu Kang, the foreign minister spokesman. China's kind of, they're making excuses for why they're building this land that isn't for obvious control. And their big point is that it will enable them to provide a better public services to aid navigation and production in the South China Sea. This was said by General Fan Changlong. However, these areas, if they're not made for military use, it doesn't make sense that China is building military airstrips on these islands. They've already finished one, and they're building two more, and airstrips of that size are not necessary for anything other than military use. It kind of nullifies their point that they're just doing it for aiding the neighboring nations in the area as a whole. So in summary, why is China building new islands in the South China Sea? They're building new islands in the South China Sea for the natural resources, for the control of important area, and to push other nations to see how far they will bend before they break. Um, in conclusion, uh, China is doing this for many reasons. However, they want to see how far they can push everyone. And that's the most important reason. That's the reason we need to be most worried about. And that goes back to that bully, the bully who pushed you might have gone, if they had been getting bigger and bigger, you would have wanted to do something to combat that, to fight that off, and stop them from being strength. Thank you. 6.33, what'd you like? Hi, my name is Jasmine. Hi, Jasmine. I'm very proud of you, Nick. You know, you've had your power stance, very engaging. You like didn't even need your notes maybe for like one word for a name and that gave you credibility so I'm okay with that. And you know, I really enjoyed it and I'm persuaded by you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Improvement Lala also known as Layla. Uh I think you improved greatly from your first speech in the first place. Um second thing, um Something you can improve on. Uh, maybe just um, don't look at your notes. I feel like since you knew you had it in your back pocket, you just sort of um, keep kept reaching for it. Yeah, it took a lot of effort to bring it out. Maybe in your front pocket or something, or a smaller note, just keep in your hand or something. I like your speech. Um, why is China building new islands in the South China Sea? You started with the bully and. Uh, I would have liked kind of a background about um, how this all started, when it started, and um, my big overarching mm, concern is I didn't get much mention about Japan in this analysis and in this critique, and I think they're kind of a player in this. So I would have liked to have seen you included. I didn't actually see much about them, which I thought was weird. Yeah. Like, well, they are a player, and we have yeah. said we're if 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 Japan is protested, and we have said we'll back Japan if the Chinese make any effort to attack them from these islands and okay. this sort of thing. And there's another set of disputed islands in which we have said 
will back Japan over China. So they there's a history of playing games with islands in the South China Sea. And it would have been interesting for the audience to hear this game playing, this brinksmanship that China's engaging with in Japan. That's just my overarching thing that yeah. would have been nice to hear. But let me go through this. Piece. I like the bully. I thought it was appropriate and good. I, yeah, it's a little um, Americentric, but I, I, I buy the... I've seen the foreign policy articles and I think that the president has been trying to pivot and shift our policy away from the Middle East toward the Pacific because I think there are people in our government that see the new problems occurring in the Pacific, not in the Middle East. So, um, And China would be perceived as the bully, so I think it's an apt analogy, at least from the American perspective. Your thesis, uh, it, I, I'm a, like it to one, resources, control two of territories, and three, see how far they'll push other islands to go. Um, it was pretty hard to get this relevant to the class, but I thought you made a, 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 a good try. It, it, it's a stretch. Yeah, it's a stretch, and, and in the end, it got a little vague, but... You tried, and it tells me that you understand the concept of the significant statement. You were trying, you were trying awfully hard to sell it, and that's and sometimes it's hard, but um, you tried. On your body, on the natural resources, the John McManus quote from Miami. I didn't get a date. Date helps credibility, so cite the date. Uh, the pulses, the larval fish was an interesting piece of analysis that uh, was interesting. Uh, some a little bit more specifics on just how much gas and oil is there and how much China wants to get their little hands on that. I and find like maps of natural resources and stuff there yeah. and I couldn't really find anything. It just kept showing the trade route over and over again. Yeah, but no 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 gas reserve potentials, yeah. yeah. And you, you were you were using Mickey Garrell's deep internet to look look through these okay. Okay, well you tried. Okay, so you knew that was something you wanted to yeah. look for, right? Okay, good. Um Yeah, on your second point, as I said, uh these all are contested by and Taiwan and Japan. And because um, if you look at the map, you'll see that Japan's right there, too. Yeah. Um, the trade route, five trillion, do a little more emphatic vocal variety with your voice. Five trillion in world trade going through this lane, this kind of thing. 1.2 trillion in U.S. trades going through this lane. You know what I'm saying? So you get a little emphasis going on, so that was good. Uh, pushing the neighbors to see how far they go, I thought that was good. Uh, you, we finally, in your third point, we're getting some interesting background that I think could have come up in the background statement. In your, uh, Just after your significant statement, you could have had a little background statement about the UN Convention says you get 12 nautical miles off the yeah. shore and... But not if it's, you know, da, 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 da. and then explain how China is trying to get around this and how they're building this and so yeah. forth. There was yeah. a little bit more on that that I kind of wanted to include, but I didn't. I yeah. was practicing the speech and it wasn't fitting. Going over time, yeah. Okay. Uh, your quotes from the Chinese um, were good. Yeah. Uh, so that was good. Um, and then your summary, your conclusion, and your tie back to the bully were all fine. And then you had your your uh, bibliography here, so that was good. As I said in the beginning, more of an emphatic delivery for your final speech. And um, I just, uh, you know, uh, I'm just saying I just thought Japan was lacking in the overall analysis. But other than that, it was a good job, and it was an improvement over your last speech. Thank you. Oh, and try not to use the notes at all next yeah. time. Yeah, thank you.
Okay, I'll, who's the next person that can go up there and put there and, yeah, good, thank you. This is you? Yeah. Great. Oh, you wore white today. You have a black coat or something? I do. Let's put it on. Cody, can you put it on? The coat. The coat. You're just a talking head otherwise. Yeah. yeah. Leather, boy, you must be wealthy. Thrift shop. Thrift shop, huh? Cool. So you're, you're wise to get used clothing. I used to do that. It lasts forever, so... Yeah. It's good to recycle clothes. Okay, and we are rolling. We are about to hear an extemp speech from Kai, who's going to address the question, what does the recent attack on the U.S. ambassador to South Korea say about the world view on the U.S.? Question mark. Question mark. Yeah. Question mark. And we are rolling. The U.S. is just a big, fat, international bully. That's what my friend said when I asked him what his international school peers thought about the United States. I strongly disagree with this opinion, and I will cite two historical events that have led to our rather unique position in world affairs today. First, World War II made us into one of the dominant powers in the world. And the Cold War led us to enforce a policy of combating communism by spreading democracy. Today, we're kind of caught in a trap of our own making. We can't take a backseat in world affairs anymore, but we must be sure to maintain our reputation abroad. Now today, I'd like to answer the question, what does the recent attack on the U.S. ambassador to South Korea say about the world's view on the U.S.? Um, my opinion, actually my stance on this, is that this recent attack actually proves that we have allies abroad um, instead of enemies. And I will give you one reason which suggests that we do have enemies, but two particular reasons during this event that happened that proves that we have allies abroad. Uh, first, um, what happened is there's been many attacks on U.S. ambassadors in recent years. However, in this particular instance, this attack was condemned with such speed and intensity by the South Korean government that it's clear that they have good feelings towards us. And third, many of these attacks on our ambassadors have been made by extremist groups or highly opinionated individuals that were not representative of the majority. Um, it's important to keep our international reputation in mind going forward because it's going to be the key to our cooperation and moving forward and making progress with other nations in the future. Now, the first thing that this incident suggests is that we're widely hated across the world. Anne Smedinghoff, John Mine, Roger Davies, who are these people? They're all U.S. ambassadors killed in the line of duty abroad. A CNN article published on March 18th records Anne's dad's words um, following her death. He said, we thought she would be safe in the embassy, but as it turns out, Anne wanted to do a lot more. Anne was only 25 when she was killed, delivering supplies to a school in southern Afghanistan. Now what does Anne's story teach us going forward? It teaches us that certain groups will not hesitate to act on their dislike for the U.S., leading to casualties of young, talented, and bright individuals like Anne. Now in this instance, our ambassador Mark Lippert, the ambassador of South Korea, escaped with some wounds. Um, Surgeon Jung Nim Suk of Yongsei University in South Korea said that Lippert was lucky to get away with a cut on his face, four inches long and one inch deep, and he needed 80 stitches to recover. Mm. Um, this atrocious attack on our ambassador was highly, 
highly discouraging to the diplomatic mission abroad. But after reading more about it through different articles, I learned that this actually wasn't the case, and the South Koreans actually heavily condemned it right after. This leads me to my second point. The intense and quick um, condemnation of this attack on Mark Lippert demonstrates that we actually have allies abroad, as well as enemies. When resting in the hospital, Mr. Lippert was visited by the President of South Korea herself, who said, this attack not only is a physical attack on the U.S. ambassador, but is also an attack on the South Korea-U.S. alliance, and it cannot be tolerated. After that, citizens wished uh, him well, conducted pro-U.S. rallies, and also organized dances um, by the U.S. Embassy in Seoul. Uh, and also, one well-wishing man offered him dog meat to recover, so it's kind of interesting. Um, I would say all these actions, excluding the dog meat maybe, uh, demonstrate South Korea's goodwill towards the U.S. and proves that we have some allies abroad. Now, back to my third point. Um, what I'd like to say is that these attacks on our ambassadors, this one in particular, is an isolated incident that's not representative of the majority of the population. Kim Ki Jong, that was the name of the man who stabbed our ambassador. And he was described by a Huffington Post article published on March 3rd to be an anti-U.S. activist and also a lone wolf warrior. The New York Times published an article on March 9th that goes on to explain that conservative Korean um, ideology teaches citizens of Korea that the United States ought to be looked at as a savior that sacrificed tens of thousands of our own troops to protect Korean interests in the Korean War. So, in summary, we have friends abroad as well as enemies. Uh, to wrap it up, true, uh, U.S. ambassadors have been attacked many times in recent years. However, this particular attack on our ambassador demonstrates that not only do we have friends, but, well, no, that we have friends. Sorry. Um, so, in conclusion, I would say there's no doubt that this attack on the U.S. ambassador to South Korea proves that we do have allies abroad as well as enemies. Of course, some of this might be contingent upon the fact that we are the dominant power in the world. And um, you kind of have to respect us, in a way. But in general, I would say we've handled our power much better than other nations, like Rome, Macedonia, Germany, who've used their power to oppress and conquer other people. Uh, so I'd like to ask you, do you think the United States is a big, fat, international bully? I don't think so. I think we're just big and fat. So, <laughs> yeah, that's a speech for another day. Thank you. Six twenty one. <laughs> First of all, that was a good joke at the end. Oh, hi, I'm Bridget. Hi, I'm Bridget. Hi, Bridget. Hi, Bridget. That joke at the end was really good. I, <laughs> I brought it all together and everyone was, I don't know, happy. It was like a little punchy ending. Um, also, you seemed very confident. Um, so, overall, great job. Thanks. Improvement. Hi, my name is Raymond. Uh, hi, hi, my name is Raymond. Hi, hi Raymond. Raymond. Um, really good job, again, that joke at the end. Um, <laughs> One, I guess, um, the notes, I guess, that's always a go-to. Um, two, I, um, because your speech is very um, related to, like, international relations, um, I was, um, I'd like to start off with more historical content so uh, your audience knows um, more of what you're talking about. Mm. So it's okay. Good. Thanks. Not a bad idea. Um, so... Let's talk about your speech. I liked it. It was well researched. You had many sources that you cited most of the time with the dates and that gave it credibility and who said it and when, so I liked that very much. Um, you know, uh, the question asked, what does the that is the tax say about the world's view of the U.S.? And you pretty much dealt with Koreans' view of the U.S. and um, 
But I think the question really was asking that, and so I'm not going to dock you too much for not taking the world's view because it's I don't think you can generalize. Yeah, yeah, every incident is different, but um, there's attacks all over the world, as you know, and as you pointed out. But the question did ask about the world's view of the U.S. and. Um, I don't know in your research, but there have been international surveys. I don't know if you saw these in your research of done of different. I didn't really know how to connect those uh, with the to event. To that event, exactly right. Okay, so your intro, you use the metaphor of the bully, and interesting in light of the last speech, and so everyone's going bully today. What? We planned it. We planned it, right? Okay, so maybe the next one will have a bully too. Okay. And um, you gave us a little bit of historical context talking about World War II and the Cold War, mm -hmm. although you didn't mention the Korean War, mm -hmm. which was really the most pertinent to this uh, mm, situation, yeah. I think. So I would have put a little... Uh, sentence or two in about the Korean War just for your audience's knowledge okay. on the um, thesis I thought you instead of taking the standard yes they hate us and this just proves it I thought you took a courageous stand of saying this proves we actually have friends and at least we have friends in the Korean government and they really uh, manned up at this event and the, the president of Korea came and they did dances and sent flowers and so forth and sent us a dead dog you know that's the ultimate uh, act of friendship um, your sixth statement was okay uh, I think you could have done a better job of selling this but it's hard these are international topics Korea is way over there you know Except for our phones and our TVs, it's just yeah. way over there. Um, you cited um, in your first reason other people that were killed, and uh, you gave a rather, you started with a rather emotional uh, story about Anne. Got people's attention. It got people's attention. Very emotional. Yeah. Uh, and I like this, uh, sort of. I prefer, uh, I think it's more effective to start with a big general statistic and to say, but these large statistics of attacks all over the world are meaningless. And let's, but let me tell you about the story of one person, that, uh, and this is Anne Smegloff, or whatever her name was, Smeghoff. And, and then tell her story. Mm. And rather than, because in the world of, for example, debate, if you launch into a story, well, they think, this is one instance. Is this a hasty generalization? Should I generalize on basis on Anne? Yeah. Where's the rest of the story? Um, the second story you told was also a uh, very uh, great word pictures. I was shuddering. You really got to me with the 80 stitches and the, in, and the inch deep cut Ugh. you know you got me that was, that was excellent on the um, your as you put this segues into my second point yeah um, you point out that the uh, president came and the, the citizens wished him well and you know all this kind of thing the dog meat and uh, so that was um, all a good reason for taking this position uh, on your uh, third point um, I think you uh, had good evidence that this was an isolated incident and I think you had a good evidence from the Huffington Post on this uh, that suggested this wasn't a big groundswell in Korea mm. that was anti-American, but rather an isolated incident. So that was pretty good, compelling argument there. 
Um, maybe, um, maybe some, if you were going to stay just with South Korea, some South Korea opinion polls or something mm -hmm. might have brought even more home there. Summary, conclusion, and tie back were all fine. Uh, you did it in 621, so this was good. My, my only quibble just with this, uh, Kai, was that just, uh, do your emotional stuff after you set your groundwork with your statistic. As far as making this speech sticky, uh, what 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 did you put in here that was unexpected? For example, um, I think just changing up like the three like reasons why something. I gave the counter argument first and then disproved it. Okay. Um, That's not bad. Making yeah. it sticky. I think some of the images I gave were very like visceral, like. The 80 stitches is yeah. super mm -hmm. gnarly. Yeah. And so you got a good emotional and you re and you let us relive that, so that was good. Mm -hmm. Felt sensing on that. Okay, good. I think your thesis was pretty straightforward. It was simple enough. So that was good. Your credibility on your sources was fairly well substantiated. So that was pretty effective. So it was a pretty effective speech. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Before I go, can I ask a question? Free country. For the last two speeches, uh, because it asked what the other, like, um, the question doesn't propose a position. Do you have to take one still? Uh, yeah. You have to, do. How do you take a position? Like, yes. Do you agree or disagree with the quote? Um, no, no, um, no, no, on, no, I, I, you're talking about your impression? No, not for, no, for oh. the last, like, uh, exempt ones. Oh. How do you agree with them if they're asking what should the U.S. do or what... Well, you, you, this is a, that, you just answered these questions. So you don't have to take a position? You no, you just, you just answered the question. I thought you meant the impromptu. Oh, no, no, no. For okay. those. The impromptu, I want you to say, I don't want you to straddle the fences. I, I can't decide whether I agree or disagree with this quote. There's two ways to look at it. I don't want any mamby pamby like that. Okay, let's hear. Who's, who's, is this the fourth one? Third one. I realize I spoke vaccination. Here's my eval, and there's my Yeah, you 